previous year. Good morning. Before beginning, I want to recognize members of the Board of Regents. I see our chair, Dr. Bearden. Our faculty regent, Dr. McFadden. And is Mr. Haskins here somewhere? I don't see him yet. Our student regent, Ms. Brianna Smith. Welcome to the annual Women's Day Convocation. We're very excited to be welcoming back KSU's own Patricia Russell McLeod. Ms. Russell McLeod began her road to success right here at KSU. It was fun researching through the archives and learning about the legacy that she began right here in Frankfurt. Thank you to the staff from Blazer Library for all of your research. To the students, use her journey as an inspiration as you carve your own. Please welcome melodic ambiance. Blessing to stand on the planet as a woman, a creative and divine instrument of the infinite intelligence of life. Not only are we divine, we are phenomenal. Good morning. Today I would like to introduce a phenomenal woman, Ms. Patricia Russell McLeod. Ms. Russell McLeod is a visual speaking experience. With more than 20 years on the lecture circuit, she is categorized as being one of the nation's best. With a speaking state style that is engaging, highly sustainable, well-researched, pertinent to our audience, and entertaining. Ms. Russell McLeod received a bachelor's degree from Kentucky State University, where she then went on to Howard University School of Law to receive her Juris Doctorate. She has received many honors, served as the 11th National President of the Lynx Incorporation, and the National Parliamentarian to Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She has been named as one of the top five business motivators in the country by Black Enterprise and identified as one of the top 10 speakers in America. Please help me welcome KSU's very own phenomenal woman, Ms. Patricia Russell McLeod.
Kentucky State University, what is life? Life is an opportunity, benefit from it. Life is beauty, admire it. Life is a challenge, complete it. Life is a promise, fulfill it. Life is a song, sing it. Life is a struggle, accept it. Life is an adventure, dare it. Because we focus upon her story in history. Her story in history. Her story. Influential women who have changed the world through women's rights and education. Those who have been willing to teach to touch a life and not just to make a living. Literature and servant leadership politics and law and medicine and women who have championed being humanitarians. We look at Cleopatra, the ruler of Egypt, and the 17-year-old Joan of Arc of France, Elizabeth I, the Queen of England, and she was over a dominant superpower. Harriet Beecher Stowe with Uncle Tom's ca Cabin, which became the clarion call that anti-slavery was the mindset of the day. And Abraham Lincoln was clear that it was that book that was a major factor behind the American Civil War. Queen Victoria presiding over Britain for 64 years. Florence Nightingale, which changed the role and perception of the nursing profession. She led a significant improvement in the treatment of wounded soldiers. Susan B. Anthony ensured that there would be a voice of women's rights and the promotion of women and uh, the clarion call that women must have the right to vote. Emily Dickinson became one of the greatest American writers in the 20th century. We look at Marie Curry, who really was hallmark in the STEM programs, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. She became not one Nobel Peace Prize awardee, but two. She received the first in physics and the second in 1911 in chemistry. Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf, and became the advocate for those like affected. And when asked, oh, Mrs. Keller, is there anything worse than being blind? She said, oh, yes, there's something much worse than being blind. And they said, what could it possibly be? What could be worse than being blind? She said, having eyesight but no vision. Having eyesight but no vision. Coco Chanel, who was the 20th, 20th century innovative revolutionary fashion designer and human rights champion, Eleanor Roosevelt, the political aide to her husband, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president of the United States. Mother Teresa, the global icon who gave service to the poor and the oppressed all throughout thousands of individuals in Calcutta, India, and was ultimately awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979. Rosa Parks, Montgomery, Alabama, 1955. And she would go to work every day, and on this given day, she came home, and all of a sudden, they wanted her to move to the back of the bus. But on that day, Miss Rosa Parks said, no, I am tired and I'm not going to move to the back of the bus. And for over 300 days, the bus boycott came into play in Montgomery, starting a civil rights movement, and she became known as the mother of civil rights. Queen Elizabeth II, the Queen of England, 
since 1952, and India Gandhi, the first female prime minister in India, Eva Perón, who was the champion of the ordinary people of, of Argentina, and Betty Friedan, who authored the feminine movement. Margaret Thatcher in Britain, who became that first prime minister, and uh, Bhutta, the first female prime minister of a Muslim country. She helped to move Pakistan from a dictatorship to a democracy. And yes, oh, Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, the influential talk show host who everything she touches becomes gold. Her show, her book club, and uh, her analysis of issues that impact women. And Madonna, the female musician of all time, she has sold an excess of 250 million records. J.K. Rowling, who was very poor, British author, phenomenal bestseller of Harry Potter, who was the revivalist for children's books. So what shall we do with what we know? All of this says to us that you must do the thing that you think that you cannot do. So whether you're African American or European American, Hispanic American, Latino American, or Native American, some will tell you that you can't. But I've come to tell you that you can. You can analyze the situation. You can investigate the resources. And you can develop a plan. Because if you set a goal at nothing, it's for sure you're going to hit it every time. So Kentucky State, if you want a thing bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give your time and your peace and your sleep for it, if gladly you'll sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it, if you'll simply go after that thing that you want with all of your capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope and confidence and stern personality of neither cold nor famine nor gaunt nor sickness nor pain of body or brain, if none of those things can keep you away from that thing that you want, if dogged and grim you will besiege and beset it, surely you will get it. Go for it because today we celebrate her story in history. Good morning. To the community of faith and certainly to our esteemed president, Dr. Raymond M. Burris, uh, Kentucky State University, my beloved alma mater, to our uh, interim Vice President of Academics, Dr. Beverly Downing, and certainly to Dr. Vernell Bennett in Student Affairs, who has expertly coordinated my program participation, to Dr. Karen Bearden, our distinguished chairman of the board of the Board of Trustees, Dr. McFadden, Board of Trustees, student representative from the board, and to all the distinguished administrators, faculty, and staff Staff, and certainly the students of Kentucky State University for being here and representing your class. Class 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and I hope not much more beyond that. To the Soras of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, hearts that are loyal, and hearts that are true to the Panhellenic family and to the fantastic choir of which I was a part while here, the melodic ambiance choir. Let's give them a round of a pet. They were off the chain, y'all. They were off the chain. Excellent. Thank you for being here. I'm so pleased to be invited to share my thoughts with you to be on campus for Women's History Month. Because one writer said, it's hard to be a woman. You have to act like a lady, think like a man, look like a young girl, and work like a horse. <laughs> so clearly, women's history does not rewrite history. 
but it does add a very different perspective and a historical significance. So you ask, who are we? We are the issue of an ancestry, and we've authored a legacy, and by our deeds and declarations, we've caused the whole nation to pause and ponder what manner of women are these. We're yesterday and modern day, for we cover the gamut of accomplishment and achievement. We are women preparing to reach beyond our grasp, to strive when we are weary, to cope when copping out is an option, to ensure reason and not rhetoric, and to affirm substance and not substitutes. Because students, the most important thing is to recall that there are two most important days of your life. The day that you were born and the day you find out why. The day you're born and the day you find out why. So Maya Angelou says that we're phenomenal women. She says, pretty women wonder where my secret lies. Uh, I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size, but when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. Uh, it's in the reach of my arms and the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say, it's in the click of my heels. It's in the bend of my hair. It's in the palm of my hand uh, and the need of my care because I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman, that's me. So women have been virtually excluded from the history books. They focus this month upon Women's History Month to dig deeper into the contributions and the triumphs as well as the struggles of women. So the theme for the month is weaving the stories of women's lives into the essential fabric of the nation's history. The stories of women are written and lived and reported to encourage girls and young women to do what? To think larger and bolder, to respond more courageously, to speak with greater responsibility and to be unapologetic, to be unapologetic about your hopes and your dreams and your aspirations and your desires. So her story in history, her story in history says that men and boys will come up with a new idea as to who women are. Let there be no assumptions about what we can't do. Let there be no stereotypic portrayals of women because women are there through it all, no matter how long the journey, or cold, the chill, or fierce the enemy, or few the friends, whether we're talking about Michelle Obama, or Hillary Clinton, or Nancy Peloso, we are her story makers. And we have to know how important we are. We're not an add-on. We're not an afterthought. Women are key and mainstream and essential. I'm talking about mama and big mama and the aunt down the street. I'm talking about the cousin. Is that your cousin? No, that's not my cousin, but that's my cousin's cousin's cousin. So is that your, my cousin? I'm talking about women, sisters, and friends, and best friends who happen to be gender female. So for the moments that are mine, I'm going to speak on her story in history. I'm a lawyer, and lawyers deal a great deal with facts. Facts will tell you what happened and when it happened and who it happened to. So when you look at the facts, you're the one that we've been waiting for. You're the one that we've been waiting for, and then we'll look at the evidence which will buttress our facts because the future started yesterday, and we're already running late. 
The future started yesterday and we're already running late. And finally, as a child, I played a game and perhaps you played it. One would run out and they would say, I dare you. And then another would run out behind him and say, I double dare you. May I suggest to you that you are the one that we've been waiting for. Kentucky State knowledge is power. And information is the positive response to a negative threat. And what you don't know will hurt you because ignorance is not bliss, it is destructive. Think about it. What would you do if you were not allowed to get an education? Because now it is true that more twins are being born today. More twins are being born today. The elementary school teacher asked the question, uh, does anybody in class know why more twins are being born today? The little girl said, I know. I know why more twins are being born today. And so the teacher said, do you really know? She said, I really know. I know why more twins are being born today. She said, well, why is that? She said, more twins are being born today because they're scared to come up in here by themselves. <laughs> and so we need women who are empowered to grasp their education to dare to make the difference because now you remember when you looked around your office and you looked around your home and the only thing you could see was made in America. And now when you look at any of your devices, any of your items, where is it made? China, Mexico, somewhere else other than America. Now there's going to be one billboard and it's simply going to read, if you can't deliver, don't advertise. Because the issue is not only to work hard, it's to work smart. And even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. Intellectual capital is in. Brains are in. Money may not buy happiness, but it will pay the consultant to study the problem. Hello? <laughs> what does it mean? To be educated, it means that you will master history and social issues, that you are dealing with knowing and understanding a second language, because no longer is it parlez-vous francais or espagnol, it is race ipsa, l'aquator, the thing speaks for itself. You will know business and finance, you will balance your own checkbook, and you will be able to go to other countries and be able to compute the Currency. In other words, students, in life, you have to be prepared. You can strike out or you can hit a home run. But you have to be in the game to play the game. And once you learn to play the game, Somebody comes along and moves all the bases. So now we need leaders, women and men leaders. When 90 leaders were asked, what does it take to lead? They didn't talk about dress for success or any other lib formula that passes for wisdom in the national press. They talked about staying on the cutting edge. They talked about arriving early and staying late because any leader knows that leadership is not personality, it's performance. Leadership is not effort, it's results. And leaders understand that good intentions will never suffice when a backbone is required. So, thoroughbreds, if you think you're leading and you look back and nobody's following, Perhaps you're just out for a walk. <laughs> oh, it's fine to clap, because guess what? It's true. Now, we need bold and courageous thought leaders. We need decision makers. And some will say wait, but those who say wait, 
They don't have a frame of reference for waiting because if they knew what it meant to wait, they would already know that we are the head waiters in line. So educate and lead and serve. Have the revolutionary idea that you are going to be a part of Black Lives Matter. Be a part of the idea that you are going to seek fair play and equality and uh, find the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Prepare to build a building that will be standing here after we're gone. Prepare to engage your time and talent to cure illness and promote wellness and to save our environment. And prepare to give your time and talent to somebody else because people want to know that you care before they care what you know. Love is not what makes the world go round. Love is what makes the ride worthwhile. So. It's not going to be an easy task. How many of you have ever been through something? On campus, at the job, see the lights are low so nobody's gonna take roll. How many have ever been through something? Okay, so all of us, I'm raising two hands. These women contributors on campus, your parents, your grandparents, all of these professors, all of the students have been through something. So may I suggest to you that our task is to know that the road is not easy. You're going to need to know that in life, you'll be disillusioned and disparaged and disarrayed and disavowed. There's going to be a day you'll be disbelieved and disgruntled and disillusioned, disconnected and disliked and disputed and sometimes just dissed. So do the math. Every year, you multiply 365 days by 18 waking hours and we have 6,570 hours to spend wisely or not. So in today's economy, the only thing more expensive than not getting an education for college is your willingness to say, I'm going to drop out rather than stay in. Women hold more positions of elected officers in offices in the federal government than ever before. Women currently hold 104 of the 535 seats in the Congress. 20 of those seats, 100 in the Senate, and 84 in the House of Representatives. But business as usual is now business unusual. When you look at her story, her story is blurred. Why? Because in her story, we look at glass ce ceilings that you can see through, but you can't get through. Women are still making 78 cents of the dollar that men make in the workplace. And leadership is key because we're going to have to put the problems on the table. When women working full time are starting at about 39,000 and the medium for men is often as much as 50,000. So we look at women being that woman who takes the leave to support her husband, who takes care of a family member and she takes the leave, or she's the one who doesn't get the promotion when she was equally qualified. And who complains the most? The millennial generation, that's your generation. The millennials are those who are bringing it to sight. The women are saying 45% of them that something has to be done and only 9% of the men are saying that it's a, a, a issue worth consideration. So inquiring minds want to know, through it all, what is it that causes women to refuse to support women? Inquiring minds want to know, why do women treat each other so differently? Why do we engage in caustic gossip and sabotaging each other and our efforts? May I say to you that it's a sad story if women do not support women. <laughs> Madeline Albright, who was the 
then Secretary of State for the United States, said it this way. She said, there's a special place in hell for women who do not support women. And Russell McLeod said, send the elevator back down. Whatever you're doing, whatever position you hold, send the elevator back down. Once you're on that 46th floor, be certain to help somebody else. Because if you want to help yourself, help somebody else. In other words, uh, uh, somebody should write a book about a different and new attitude. I did. I did. How many have been around people with a great attitude? It makes a difference. You believe that it can happen. You, you believe that, that something can be improved because of a positive attitude. But how many have been around people who have a negative attitude? Who thought this up? Why are we going to do it this way? We need positive attitudes. Listen. Toxic people do not need to be a part of your environment. Toxicity spreads. Improve the attitude. Cancel the pity party. Cancel the pity party because 85% of the people don't care what you're going through and the other 15% are glad it's not them. Hello? I am first generation college. I am first generation college. I came up in Indianapolis, Indiana, where we were so poor, there was no R on the word poor. We were poor. <laughs> I came to school. I did not have a car to drive to get to the campus. So I got a ride to get to Kentucky State University. I did not have an electronic device so I could do my algebraic uh, computations and anything else on my device. I did not have a bed in a bag so I could decorate my room in Kentucky Hall. I did not have anything of art so I could put on my walls. But may I suggest to you four years later while some begged out, while some pleaded out while some played bid whiz trying to get out. I put my degree under my arm and I marched out. Her story in history. We need a new attitude. A is for your attitude and that's going to determine your altitude, how high you're going to fly in this life and B is for brain power and that's the best demonstration of who you are. C is for your courage to be strong in a time in which you have neither the motivation nor the inclination to be inspired. D is for dedication to causes that are just and E is for the effort that you have to put forth every day to be a superstar just to be considered average. F is for freedom. That is not free. And G is for the genius in each one of us. And H is for our heritage, rich and pure. And I is for the intuition to look beyond the obvious because women are intuitive. Women are intuitive. It doesn't mean that men don't have a sixth sense, but women are intuitive. What do I mean? You ask any woman in here, how do you know how to do that? And she's going to tell you, I don't know how you, I know how to do that, but I know that I know how to do that. How do you know? I don't know. I just know. Men understand team play. Men will debate with you at 10 o'clock. They will argue with each other at 11 o'clock. But at 12 o'clock, those same two men are having lunch together. Women... It'll take a little longer. <laughs> J is for justice and the fact that you must fight every day to keep it colorblind. K is for know-how to create and implement a master plan for our future. L is for life and it is true you only go around one time and this is not a practice run.
M is for meditation. Take time to get to know who you are. N is for now. For now is the hour. And O is for the opportunity to make a difference. P is for the promise that you hold for generations yet unborn. Q is for the questions that you must always be willing to ask. And R is for the roots. For as a twig is bent, so shall it grow. S is for survival. And it will be the survival of the swiftest. And T is for the truth that you must be willing to tell. U is for the unity that we must achieve. V is for the vision. Never lose sight of the top of the mountain. And W is for the willpower to rise to the top of the crop. X is for x-ray. Hold people, persons, and things up to the light. Y is for you and your contribution. And Z is for the zodiac and your place in the sun. We're looking for you, waiting for you. There's a famine for women at the board table. There's a famine for women in the top executive jobs. Prepare, 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 because you're the one that we've been waiting for. The future started yesterday, and we're already running late. So you have to be a risk taker. You have to be a risk taker, and then you say, no, 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 I'm not a risk taker. You're a risk taker. If you weren't a risk taker, you wouldn't have gone from one side of your town to the other side of your town. If you weren't a risk taker, you wouldn't have come out to college and said, I'm going to pursue a major. I'm going to identify an academic area for my academic matriculation. If you weren't a risk taker, you wouldn't have said, I'm going to take on an internship program or I'm going to apply for overseas study. If you weren't a risk taker, you wouldn't have walked in the student union and walked up to a young, a significant uh, young gentleman standing there and said, what's your name? Have I seen you before? If you weren't a risk taker, you would not have been able to try your own cooking. So you're a risk taker. Students, every woman should know. Every woman should know that they can control their destiny. Every woman should know how to quit a job or break up with a significant other or confront a friend without taking it personally. And every woman should know when to try harder and when to walk away. And every woman should know that they can't change the length of their calves or the nature of their parents. And every woman should know what it means to have a set of screwdrivers and a cordless drill. And every woman should have one friend who lets her laugh and another friend who lets her cry. And every woman should know what she would and wouldn't do for love and with money. And every woman should know how to live alone even if she doesn't have to. And every woman should have a best friend who lets her sit down, whether at the summer house or at her own cottage and tell her heart secrets to. Every woman should have furniture of her own, at least a piece that wasn't a hand-me-down from another family member. And every woman should have a recipe that she can cook beautifully and honor her guest. And if not, then know about a takeout restaurant that makes it look like you've been cooking all day. Every woman should know that even if you're Childhood was not perfect. Guess what? It's over. You're full grown now, and you are those who must turn a stumbling block into a stepping stone and an obstacle into an opportunity. You have to turn a barrier into a benchmark, and even when you believe you've reached the end of your rope, you have to be able to tie a knot and hold on. You are a thoroughbred. Clearly, everybody does not deserve a front row seat in your life. I'm going to say it again. 
Everybody does not deserve a front row seat in your life. And what it means is keep it moving. Fear may turn you around, but keep it moving. Fear of what others may think and fear that you won't succeed and, and fear that somebody's going to talk about you. Those things which make you exceptional will also make you lonely. Those things which make you exceptional will also make you lonely, but yours is not to follow the crowd. Yours is to lead the parade. I'm going to tell you one quick true story. I was on this campus and it was time to pledge. I was on scholarship, but it was time to pledge. I'm first generation, so my parents didn't understand pledging, but if I started my junior year with Dr. Cheney in history and political science, I didn't have time to pledge, so I had to make up my mind. Either you're going or you're not. Six people started, one went forward, me. It, the only one. That's why I can speak with this passion. Because you make up your mind, you're going to be somebody. You make up your mind, you're going to keep it moving. So her story went into the gymnasium and did the Greek show all by myself. So I'm reminded of the the lady who was being honored that day, and she was so excited because her whole company was there. And all of a sudden, in this huge ballroom of 2,500 people, she came up the steps and she fell. Kabloom. And everybody was stunned. A hush came over the whole audience, and they said, oh my, how's she going to recover? She grabbed the mic. She went up to the podium, and she said, I am so honored to be here tonight. And I am so honored to tell you that I'm being honored because I know what it means to be all the way down. And I know what it means to get up. So I dare you. I double dare you. Don't be scared. You're a thoroughbred. Look at the women in your life and your legacy. You show me Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, who started Bethune-Cookman College with a nickel and a nail in her pocket. And I'll show you Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, the first female president of Morehouse Medical School. You show me First ladies of the United States of America, you show me Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy and Lady Bird Johnson, Betty Ford and Rosalind Carter, Nancy Reagan and Barbara Bush and Hillary Clinton and Laura Bush, and I will show you Michelle Obama, attorney at law, first lady of the United States of America. So how many have ever been tired? ever been tired? We lived in Africa, and they had a phrase, and it was Ebeye, say that. Ebeye, say that. Ebeye, let me tell you what it means. Things are going to get better. Things are going to get better. Why? Because the population of this country is 274 million. 140 million are retired, and that leaves 133 million to do the work. But 85 million are in school. They're going into class to find the meaning of the lesson and not lessen the meaning of the assignment. And that discovery means that they now know that a C will not see them through. They're going into class to find the meaning of the lesson and not lessen the meaning of the assignment. But that leaves 48 million to do the work. But 29 million people are working for the federal government and that leaves 19 million to do the work. But 2.8 million are in the armed forces, putting themselves in harm's way for our behalf. And that leaves 16.2 million to do the work. But if you subtract, 14.8 million people who are working for state and city government and they're in charge or being in charge. That leaves 188,000 people who are in the hospitals. 
but 1.2 million people are left to do the work. But way over, way over 1.2 million people are in prison. So that leaves two people, you and me, to do the work, to be the thoroughbred, and to do the work. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Dr. Bennett. I want to thank you, student affairs. I want to thank you, administrators and professors and faculty and staff and students, not global, not domestically, but globally. I want to thank you globally across the width and the breadth of the world because uh, the lady said, I can't do anymore. I'm inundated. Women's Month, I can't do anymore. And then she received the message that I now share with you. It said, if the problems were less difficult, we need someone with less ability to solve them. You're the best that we've got. So if I were thanking you for your commitment to excellence without excuse, I would say in English, thank you, but in Swedish, I would say talk. If I were thanking you in Finnish, I would say kitos. If I were thanking you in German, I would say danke schön. If I were saying thank you in Dutch, I would say danke. If I were thanking you in Russian, I would say space possible. If I were thanking you in French, I would say merci beaucoup. If I were thanking you in Spanish, I would say muchas gracias. If I were thanking you in Portuguese, I would say arigato. If I were thanking you in Hebrew, I would say tada. If I were thanking you in Arabic, I would say shukran. If I were thanking you in Swahili, I would say anchete. If I were thanking you in Japanese, I would say arigato. If I were thanking you in Yoruba, I would say oshe. If I were thanking you in African dialect, I would say ashante. If I were thanking you in Mandarin Chinese, I would say Sishe Sishe. If I were thanking you in Korean, I would say Kum Sam Dene. If I were thanking you in Latin, I would say Gracias. If I were thanking you in American Sign Language, I would say. If I were thanking you in Italian, I would say Milia Grazia, Infinita, Kentucky State University, Thoroughbreds. But since I am what I am, a little black girl growing up in Indianapolis, Indiana, now living in Atlanta, Georgia, where we speak in Southern dialect, I would just say thank you him. Thank you for knowing and understanding that when they tell you that it cannot be done, you focus upon her story in history and you're the one that we've been waiting for. The future started yesterday and we're already running late. Tell them that when they say it can't be done, say that I left the stage by saying, never, 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 never give up. I dare you, I double dare you. At this time, we will have a presentation by a member of the Beta Zeta chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Y'all give her another round of applause. Wasn't she great? <laughs> On behalf of the Beta Zeta chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, we would like to thank you with a gift. Okay, Ms. Russell McLeod, we have students who are tweeting questions. And let me try to pull this up here. Okay. 
Why did you choose Kentucky State University? A gentleman named Mr. William Goodwin was over at public relations, and he was a part of the recruitment team along with Dr. Carl Smith, um, the director of the concert choir. They came to Indianapolis and heavily recruited students just up the road a bit. And they were told that I was a speaker and a decent alto. So I then uh, tried out. I, I gave the creation by James Weldon Johnson and was asked to sing under Dr. Smith's direction. And then they asked of my area of interest, uh, study-wise, and it was history and political science. And they told me all about Dr. Henry Cheney. And it sealed the deal because the blessing of my life was to study under Dr. Henry Cheney at this institution. And so many more professors, but I was a history major. And so I welcomed that opportunity. I worked for Mr. Goodwin during my matriculation in public relations. I sang in the concert choir the whole time I was here. And I was the voice to the marching band for the football games. We have a question for Coco. Mrs. McLeod, what was the most significant lesson you learned while at KSU, and does it still apply to your life today? Yes, simply put students, catch up is a hard game to play. So, so don't start out as a freshman and say I'll catch, it, I'll catch up as a sophomore. I'll, I, I didn't get the A grade when I was a sophomore, but I'll hook it up when I'm a junior. Because all the time, the averages are averaging out to impact your GPA. Start with the end in mind. Be excellent when you come through the door. Be serious. It, it, college is not the party. Party is a part of it, but it's not the party. Start with the end in mind so that when you get to senior year, you already have your average ready for the workplace, ready for graduate school, and you're not trying to figure out how to convince somebody that you need to be and you're now serious to matriculate. Student Affairs is very focused on making sure our students are engaged in researching um, your time here. I saw you were in quite a bit of uh, activities. Why is it important to be engaged on campus? Because I'm going to tell you what Honorable Andrew Young said to us at uh, Howard Law School. He came and he said, look to your left and look to your right. And one of the people you're looking at will likely lead a country. One of the people right here at this school will lead countries. They will be CEOs of their own companies. They will be multimillionaires. They will be able to position and place you. It is the network. It is the family of thoroughbreds that will be a lifetime commitment. And you learn those individuals by becoming a, a part of the Board of Trustees, student affairs, uh, being a leader, being a Miss Kentucky, being in the band. You learn through the network of activities. It's not just being smart. It is also being engaged in activities so that you can have a lifetime legacy of connectedness that will be global. Are there any other questions from the audience? Please come down. We'll repeat it. <laughs> yeah, that's helpful, right? <laughs> Yeah. 
Yes. The question is, she's thanking the Lynx Incorporated for her scholarship, uh, and I'm a part of that organization. And her question directly is, why is it that women are reticent, apathetic, unwilling to step forward and become risk takers, whereas the male counterpart is more competitive, more willing to say, I'm going to go for it. Why not? They're the risk takers, and women overthink it. I would urge you that that is the truth. It is, uh, un, un, I would say, go for it. But I would say it's a calculated risk. I'm not asking you to be uh, a risk taker without thinking it through, but I'm asking you not to overthink it. Get involved or stop complaining. You cannot continue to say men have the best jobs, are paid more, etc. if you never offer yourself. And all they can do is say no. And you can learn the metrics as to why they've said no, and then you come back full circle and gain that position. The first and only positions are still there. It's regrettable that in 2015, we still are striving for first and only positions. But I would ask that you be courageous, be bold, and be willing to strive to become that first and only. Get in to the boardroom, sit at the table, be the thought leader, and take the risk. Any other questions? Before we stand for the alma mater, one more question. Presentation. Oh, so true, and we have a presentation, but if Mr. Lark, if you have that ready to roll after this question, we have a couple of presentations, and then we'll be ready for the alma mater. Great question. Uh, where did I find the inner strength in my greatest moments of uh, frustration, depression, oppression, uh, uncertainty, anxiety? Where did I find the oomph, that it factor, to keep going? Is that a fair restatement of your question? Uh, my mother and father were custodians. My mother was a matron. And they worked two and three jobs so I could be at this school. So I did not have amnesia about uh, being tired or willing to give up and give out and cash it in and say, I'm done, whatever, I'm done. No. Because my mother was taking a bus with bags in her hand. And so I felt like if she could do that, my job was to do this. And so I didn't get that frustrated. I just kept on moving. Okay, while I'm at the mic, uh, as you know, I'm a national speaker and I am always talking about STEM, the uh, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And my area of law is telecommunications because I'm from the Federal Communications Commission, Washington, D.C. I was talking to an engineer about coming here today. She's a very successful engineer in New York City, and she would like to award today a scholarship in the amount of $1,000 to a STEM student female on this Women's Month celebration. And I'm here to present it to Dr. Beverly Oh, okay, doctor. Okay. They're coming to receive it. Her name is Mrs. Abby Sunshine Adesina. Can we give her a hand, y'all? She did not go here. We're so pleased to present this to Dr. Karen Bearden, our chairman of the Board of Trustees. And on my behalf, uh, Pat Russell McLeod, 
uh, I'm impressed with the the nine campaign, and uh, I'm a member of the concert choir. So I'm pleased to present, and I'm a member of the board of PASS, the Permanent Alumni Scholarship Fund, and I'm pleased to present a thousand nine dollars for scholarships, and the designations are listed herein. Thank you so much. Thank you for your message and your kind generosity. Please stand for the alma mater. <laughs> 